Welcome back to the Saturday Scholars College Football Podcast. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. That is Gonzo. That is Zan. I am Shub, and we are here today to do Big Ten win totals. First off here, we will be covering the Big Ten East, one of the only two Power Five conferences remaining with divisions. Divisions will be going away after this year, but... Let's enjoy it while it lasts, the Big Ten East. Let's get going. You guys ready to cover this conference, this division? Oh, yeah, let's get to it. All let's right, it. let's get going. When I looked at this being eight and a half, I said to myself, no way, no how. That is an easy under. But then I opened my handy dandy notebook and I did a little bit of research. I did a little bit of digging. The Texas Longhorns, a team that perennially underachieves. Are you telling me they are going to go 10 and 2 or are they going to go 8 and 4? Get the dang police out there because it's going to be animal cruelty when they're going to put this <laughs> Buffalo through this season. Thank God that certain things are legal in Colorado because you're going to need a lot of that to watch this team. All right, starting at the top, we have the Michigan Wolverines. Michigan, a 13-1 season last year. The defending Big Ten champions. Zan, you're going to lead us off. The Wolverines have a line of 10.5. Can Michigan repeat for a third time as Big Ten champions? Let's hear it. Well, you know, Michigan is a very interesting team this year. They're they have a very good TARP rating this year, plus seven. Usually means you're going to be pretty good. Offensive efficiency, 11th. Defensive efficiency, 6th. Not really surprising for Michigan. Pretty standard uh, for what they produce. Line yards, 25. Sack rate, 36. Solid offensive lines. Also a, you know, just typical Michigan team. You know, there's a lot to like about Michigan, okay? So, one, obviously, quarterback, J.J. McCarthy returns. You know me. I'm a guy of ratios. Four to one touchdown to interception ratio. Definitely. Um something to be said about J.J. McCarthy. Can he take that next step, though? It's kind of a big thing here for Michigan to really compete for a national title. Now, Michigan making the playoffs and competing for a national title is entirely different. To be that team that can elevate themselves to that level, someone like J.J. McCarthy is going to have to step up just a little bit more. Um, he did put up some good numbers, but I think he's going to have to be a little more prolific. Um, great news for the Michigan faithful. Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards, both back elite backfield brought in a lot of offensive linemen they're going to have a very solid offensive line once again and this offense is going to be led by that elite tandem of running backs um definitely a lot to be liked there they do lose ronnie bell the wide receiver not something that i'm too keen of they don't really have a lot of true standouts at the wide receiver position they have some players who are promising but they don't have anyone who truly stands out or is just an absolute elite player they do lose Eric All for to Iowa at the tight end position, but they bring in AJ Barner from Indiana, so it's kind of a trade there. But all in all, I think the weakness of this offense is going to be its passing attack. No, not due to QB play, anything like that. It's just the wide receivers, they don't have those elite options like, say, an Ohio State does. And that's something that can be a limiting factor for the Michigan offense. But luckily, they have a great offensive line. They have a quarterback who doesn't turn the ball over. And they have some really, really good running backs. They have two NFL running backs right on roster right now, trading for carries. So that bodes really well for Michigan. On the other side of the ball, defense, they lose a few pieces in the secondary via transfer porter in the NFL. But they return a lot of guys, too, who are very, very, who are graded very, very high in pass coverage. Um, I won't go into specifics here, but they do bring in a lot of cover, uh, a lot of returners here that I really, really like. That bodes well for their secondary. They do return some linebacker production as well and also bring in Ernest Hossman, who is a 96th grade transfer from Nebraska. So their linebackers definitely look to be a pretty solid group this year. On the defensive line, they have Mason Graham and Chris Jenkins, and they and they add Josiah Stewart from Coastal Carolina, which is another really good add. He grades out well with PFF. We can't ignore that they did lose two really good interior defenders in Maxie Smith and, and Mike Morris, though, to the NFL. So 
there could be some slight regression on the D-line, but D- Michigan is always one of those teams who time in and time out produces great defensive linemen, especially for the NFL. So I'm not really too worried about that. I think they'll still have a very good defensive line. Now, their line's sitting there at 10 and a half, guys, and, and w- one reason here uh, is because their schedule. Their schedule is, is crazy easy. I mean, look at their non-con. ECU, UNLV, Bowling Green to start. That's three wins right there, and they're not going to be close by any stretch of the imagination. Then they play Rutgers. Okay, so they start with four bye weeks, and then they go at Nebraska. Uh, Look, Nebraska, uh, I I like the coaching hires Nebraska made. I think Nebraska is going to be trending in the right direction, but Nebraska is definitely going to have – they don't have a lot of roster talent this year. There's stuff definitely still in building mode right now for Matt Rule's first year. I think Michigan handles Nebraska pretty easily. They'll go at Minnesota after playing Nebraska. I think it's a probable, but I do favor Michigan quite a bit. I think Michigan will probably win that by 10, 10 to 17 points. Indiana, that's a win. Come on, guys. Why, why, why do I even mention that? that's another bye week? Uh, then they go at Michigan State. Might as well call that another bye week. That's a win. I know that's a rivalry game, so Michigan State will actually come in there and probably play them a little tougher. But come on, guys. Michigan State's. You know, they're not that good this year. I mean, they're Michigan State starting quarterback was the lead singer for BTS last year, just for all of y'all that don't know. So, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, uh, then they jump into another bye week. Wow. It's like they've got like five, six bye weeks on this schedule. It's crazy. Michigan fans, you guys are going to be very well rested going in here. Then you play Purdue. Purdue could be a little tricky. They're very hard to peg down, but I really like the coaching hires that Purdue made after losing Jeff Brom. Um, Purdue is a very, very interesting team who I think has a lot of upside, but I also have no idea really what to fully expect from them. But I do love the coaching hires from Purdue, and I think that could produce some issues. But Michigan is at home. That's going to be a win. Then this is where their schedule actually gets a little bit tough. They're probably going to go, they're probably going to go in 9-0 and into this part of the schedule. At Penn State, probably going to be a wideout game. They handled Penn, St- Penn State pretty well last year, 41-17. to 17. But the year before, it was a very, very close game in Happy Valley. I think it's going to be a wideout game. I think Penn State's going to come ready to play. Penn State is going to be a solid team this year. I think they could lose that game, especially it being an away game and especially not really being battle-tested up to that point. I think that definitely could spell a loss right there. That game's go- already scheduled for Big Noon on Fox. The Penn oh, State it? game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It still could be a wide out. Gotta, gotta love the TV contracts. <laughs> but um, at Maryland, and Maryland, I'm a little higher on Maryland this year. I really like what they're bringing in. And Maryland actually gave them quite a game last year. It was 34 to 27. And I think Maryland actually got a little bit better this year. And Maryland's at home. I think there's a chance that Maryland could spell upset because they're looking ahead to Ohio State next week. I think there is a chance that Maryland could surprise the Michigan Wolverines. And then they go play Ohio State, and luckily they're at home versus Ohio State. But I, I, I will say this, Ohio State is such a good team, and it is so hard to beat a team of Ohio State's caliber three years in a row. I don't think, even though they're at home, I, I really don't think they're going to be able to do it again unless they just, unless, you know, unless Jim Harbaugh is just Ryan Day's daddy. I guess we'll find out. But ultimately, those last three games give me cause for concern. I can, I, I can easily see Michigan going anywhere from 10-2 and two to 12-0, and 0, and it wouldn't surprise me. But guys, I, I really think this lack of being battle-tested is not going to play to their favor. I think that at Penn State game is going to be rough. I think the at Maryland game is extremely trappy because of the look ahead to Ohio State. And then you have Ohio State. I'm going with the under guys. I'm going to go 10 to Michigan. Um, it's not confident. As I said, I can easily see Michigan going anywhere between 10 and 2, 12 and 0. Neither outcome would surprise me. 10 and 2, 11 and 1, 12 and 0. No outcome surprises me, but I am lean under Michigan. Zan, phenomenal analysis. I think we can all agree that a double digit season is more likely than not for the Michigan Wolverines. You've already highlighted the personnel. I just want to look at some of the coaching. I do think losing Matt Weiss in a very weird, the computer fraud, not fraud, but the computer-related crime that got him fired, that was an interesting development that happened. And you promote Sharon Moore 
as the sole guy to call the plays, as well as promote one of your analysts, Kirk Campbell, to be the quarterback coach. And the question I have is, how's that going to gel with uh, J.J. McCarthy? I know Michigan is is a good running team. They've got the line to do it. They've got the backs to do it. But like you said, Zan, if Michigan is going to bring home the hardware to Ann Arbor, they do need McCarthy to step up and be the guy. And so those question marks are a little bit cause for concern for me. And I agree that this defense should be in a very good spot. I think Chris Partridge coming in from Ole Miss to coach those linebackers is a fantastic addition by Harbaugh. Going into the schedule, at first I had them at 10-0, and 0, no problem with the two toss-ups with Penn State and Ohio State. But honestly, the more I look at that Maryland game, the more it just screams trap game. Call Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. Ohio State at home, especially if you went into Happy Valley and beat Penn State, and you're like, oh, we just – Oh, we got to take care of Tua's younger brother. And then we get Ohio State in here for the third time going for our third straight win. I think Maryland's super trappy. I think Penn State, I don't care if they play that game at 6 a.m., 4 a.m., 11 p.m. If you got to play Penn State in Happy Valley, then that's going to be a tough game. I remember the clip of Michigan coming in years ago, and it was so loud they had to call timeout. So I think Penn State and Ohio State, I really just don't think it's likely – that again, Michigan will beat both of them. And I just think somewhere in this schedule, maybe a Maryland, maybe a Minnesota early in the season, they do get tripped up. And I just think that 10 wins is more likely than an 11 and one or even undefeated Michigan this year. That does not mean they will not make the playoff, but I just think that 10 wins is more likely. So I join you, Zan, on the under. Wow. Michigan fans are going to hate us. It's a little surprising for me, not going to lie. So I'm going to go to bat here for Michigan because I, I disagree with you guys here. I think uh, I'm over on Michigan. I, I like them for 11 wins. I think very decent possibility they could go 12-0, and 0, but more likely they're going to go – they're going to have a loss somewhere in there. It's just hard to go undefeated. But my numbers have them projected for 11.2 wins, which is pretty high. That's It's very favorable towards Michigan, and I mean – I'm just a little surprised because I look at this team and I think this team is going to be much better than last year's team was last year's team was not better than Ohio state. It's just, they happen to be the better team against Ohio state that day. And I feel like I say this every year, but the last two years, I feel like Michigan was, you know, a little inferior to Ohio state, but they just had Ohio state's numbers in the big game, both years in a row. This year, on paper, I think Michigan is actually better than Ohio State. I think they are the best team in the Big Ten. And, of course, you know, the schedule, I think they should be 9-0 and heading into those final three games. I'm not really as high on Maryland as you guys are. I know that does look like a trap game, um, but I think that they are a good lock above Maryland. And then, yeah, I mean, at Penn State, Ohio State, even if you split those, that's still an over for me because I don't see them losing any of those games on that schedule. You got such the easy ramp up. I mean, maybe at Minnesota, you know, they could have a bad, if they have a really bad game against Minnesota, maybe against Michigan State, it's in East Lansing, it's a rivalry game. But those are just unlikely, man. I, I think Michigan is the best team in the Big Ten. I think even if McCarthy doesn't take a step forward, this offense is still top 15, top 10 offense upside if McCarthy takes a step forward. And the defense is loaded, guys. I mean, the secondary is absolutely loaded. I mean, the secondary I think is very good. The defense has top three upside. I think this is this defense is going to finish potentially top three in the whole country. I just I just don't really see any holes on this roster. If I see one hole on the roster, it's special teams. Because that's the one thing I feel like special teams. We rarely mention it. Special teams. They lose both their kicker and their punter to the draft, which I think was actually hilarious. So they had both their kicker, Jake Moody, and their punter, Robbins, both got drafted. So maybe special teams takes a step back, but like that's about it. I'm over. I uh, I'm very high on Michigan, and I think on paper they are the best team in the Big Ten. Which last year and the year before you couldn't say that about Michigan. And I will say this, Shub. I mean, ten and two to twelve and zero, neither outcome surprises me. This is not one I put my personal money on, but I am. I'm leaning towards. Uh, I'm I'm calling Ohio State. This is with the assumption that they can't beat Ohio State three years straight, and then that they're going to trip up between Penn State, Maryland, or possible Minnesota, as Gonzo alluded to. 
Yeah, exactly. Hey, you never know, man. That maybe this year it's flipped. Maybe this year Michigan is the better <laughs> team all year, and then Ohio State is the one that gets them in the big game. I mean, you never know. But they do have hey, that game at home, though. It is at home, yes. No, the odds definitely are not in the Buckeyes' favor. The so I feel like is... that's a very good transition here, but go ahead, Gonzo. No, just it'll be interesting to see if the weather conditions mirror uh, what that game was two years ago. But, yes, speaking of the Buckeyes, I mean, we have come to expect this for really all of our lifetimes. Ohio State, even losing C.J. Stroud in um, the NFL draft last year, you got two five stars, Kyle McCord and Devin Brown, fighting it out to be the starter. I really don't think Ohio State can go wrong with either there, and I think they have enough in that non-con to really figure out who that guy is going to be. At the running back position, I, I'm i looking at this depth chart, and you get Travion Henderson back, who got some kind of dark horse Heisman hype last season. And behind him, Mayan Williams, Dallas Hayden. I mean, those were guys that had to play crucial snaps when Travion was hurt last season. So they come in and bring experience. In addition, this wide receiver room, that's obviously is this team's best unit. Marvin Harrison is going to be the first wide receiver taken in the upcoming NFL draft. You know, some say that if he hadn't gone hurt, maybe that game against Georgia goes a different way. But, you know, we'll never know. But that's how much of an impact player he is. Then you've got other five stars in the mix of Julian Fleming, who's a senior, Emeka Ekbuka. You've got five-star freshmen waiting in the wings Cade Stover at tight end. This is an absolutely loaded juggernaut of an offense that Brian Hartline, who has been now promoted the with the play calling duties, it's a loaded unit for Brian Hartline to work with. The offensive line, I'm a little suspect on. You lose Paris Johnson, DeWan Jones, Whitworth, Whitworth to the draft. And yes, you've got Donovan Jackson, who's going to be an NFL guy at guard, and Matt Jones at the other guard position. But outside of that, I do have some just concerns with depth and experience at this position, which is historically very good for the Buckeyes. Switching over to the defense, it is, again, loaded. JT Tuma Oloa at DN with Jack Sawyer either complimenting him or behind him is a fantastic pass rushing pair. I'll never forget what JT did against Penn state. That was like a mini Heisman campaign in itself. Just the impact he had on that game. You've also got guys like Michael Hall, who's got NFL prospects. He's anchoring nose tackle. You got Ty Williams who graded out well and PFF going up a level. I love this linebacking core. Steel Chambers comes back as a grad student. He was a great pass rusher. Tommy Eichenberger is a great run stopper. You got five-star C.J. Hicks behind them. So that's going to be a really good unit backing up the stout D1. And then the secondary, you know, some say that Ohio State is DBU. You lose a couple guys like McAllister and Brown to the draft, but then you got guys like Sonny Styles is going to play free safety. Denzel Burke, who's a projected first-rounder at cornerback with Jair Brown behind him. And also Lathan Ransom holding down the free safety spot. This is going to be a fairly good unit yet again. And now that we highlighted some personnel, let's look at the schedule for the Buckeyes. So out the gate, you know, at Indiana, you know, usually a conference game is kind of a rough start for that first game. But at Indiana should absolutely be a win. Your young town state in Western Kentucky coming in and collecting the paycheck. Those are going to be wins. At Notre Dame, there's some pause for concern. I do have that as a toss-up, but I would think it's more likely than not that the Bucs win that game. You get a bye week, which I think, you know, I know Zan has alluded to in past uh, podcasts that, you know, the bye week early usually doesn't bode too well for a team. But I think this is good for Ohio State to prepare for Maryland, even at home. So they get Maryland off the bye. I think they win that game soundly. Should beat Purdue. Now, here's our, here's our maybe our second actual challenge, depending on how Notre Dame goes. Penn State, but at home, so I lean win just because it's played in the shoe. Then at Wisconsin could be tricky, but given they got a new staff and they're kind of rebuilding everything there, I think that's most likely a win. You go at Rutgers for a bye week. Michigan State for that double bye. Minnesota could be tricky, but again, that's at home. And then we've got 
the big game at Michigan, which of course is a toss up because you've lost the last two. But even given this schedule, as I've highlighted it, I'm going to be over on the Buckeyes. I do see 11 wins here. I think just drawing Penn State at home is huge. I think getting Wisconsin in a rebuilding year bodes well. I think Notre Dame, who's going to be the quarterback to beat them, even if they're playing it there in South Bend? And then, hey, you lose it to Michigan at the end of the year, you finish 11-1, and one, and Gonzo gets the cashes over. So I'm over on the Bucks. I think they're going to be really good yet again this season. I think it's pretty safe to say the offense is going to take a step back. I mean, that's pretty much a guarantee that the the offense is going to take a step back this year. I know everyone's everyone loves Brian Hartline, great position coach, great recruiter, good developer of, of elite talent, but can he call plays? Like calling plays is a whole, totally different skill than recruiting and developing. Um, a little bit of a concern for me there. And then, you know, at quarterback, obviously there's going to be a drop-off between Kyle McCord and C.J. Stroud. I, I, from what I've heard, it seems like Kyle McCord's sort of like uh, he has a safer floor. And then also you have Devin Brown, who's also in the mix as a backup. Devin Brown potentially has more upside, you know, to take over McCord potentially. But I don't know about that. I think most likely it's going to be McCord. I think the offensive tackle losses are significant, guys. I'm a little bit worried about this, and this is my ma- my main concern. You have a huge quarterback downgrade, and then you lose two elite tackles, both left tackle and right tackle. You highlighted Gonzo. I'm uh, I'm a little bit worried about that. But the defense, however, this is where I had a hard time with this line because the defense, I think, is going to be elite this year. You Ohio State fans, I'm telling you right now, you guys are going to regret complaining about Jim Knowles as your defensive coordinator because Ohio State had an insane jump. They were ninth last year in defensive efficiency. This was a top 10 defense. Yeah, they had a bad game against Michigan. It was one game. You guys literally were a field goal away from beating Georgia and then probably would have went on to win the national title game over TCU. Literally, if that field goal goes in, you guys win the national title. I do not want to hear a single Ohio State fan complain about the defense because I think it has top five upside this year. Jim Knowles' second year in the system, the defensive line, three projected first-round picks. Are you kidding me? I mean, I I think with all that being said, the defense being what I think will be elite this year is going to help you know, alleviate some of the offensive pains that I think are in store. That being said, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to go under on Ohio State, and it's a lean under. Um, This was very tough. I struggled with this one. It really comes down to the schedule. I think even if Ohio State is a great defense, when you don't have an offense that can just score 50 off the bus, as we like to say, at Notre Dame, you know, you turn the ball over a couple times, you don't have the firepower like you did last year to win that game. Penn State at home, that helps. At Wisconsin could be tricky, and then you go to go at Michigan. I just think it's more likely we see 10 and 2 than we do 11 and 1. I don't think Ohio State's a national title contender this year with with McCord at quarterback, but we shall see. If I'm wrong about this, it's going to be because the offensive line didn't take a huge step back and Kyle McCord has a pretty good year, better than what I think he's going to have. So I'm going to go lean under for Ohio State. Two losses, a little more likely than one in the regular season. I think that's a pretty fair take, given that they definitely draw a tougher schedule than Michigan this year. Um, But overall, I mean, I'm with you, Kyle McCord, I would think is going to be a little bit of a step back from CJ Stroud. But let's not forget, they also they bring back mine Williams, Travion Henderson, great running back tandem. They still produce great offensive lines year in and year out. I, I do recognize that they lost both their starting tackles, who are both great players. But Ohio State puts puts linemen in the NFL on a regular basis. I think it's kind of just a reload situation for them. They recruit at a high level. They were sixth in line yards and 11th in sack rate last year. Phenomenal offensive line uh, by all stretches. Even if that regresses to just from a top 10 offensive line to even being a top 20 offensive line, that's still a very, very solid unit. Um, Offensive efficiency was third last year under CJ Stroud. Even with Kyle McCord and even with a little bit of a drop back, they were they have so many wide receivers. They're they're, they're returning Marvin Harrison, Julian Fleming, and, and, and Mika Egbuka, and then Colonel Tate, just as Gonzo alluded to. And because their weapons are so elite at the running back and the wide receiver position, I mean, I don't see that significant 
of a drop back, despite CJ Stroud definitely probably being better than Kyle McCord. So maybe third in offensive efficiency turns into like 12th or 13th. That's still more than enough to be an elite team. You already mentioned Jim Knowles. He's absolutely elite. The Buckeyes have so much talent on their roster. Ninth in defensive efficiency. They're probably going to be top five in defensive efficiency this season. This is still a very, very, very good team, guys. Um, don't sleep on the Buckeyes. I, the only thing that I would be concerned with is if Kyle McCord ends up being a bust. But like we said, they have good depth at that position. They have some promising prospects there. So it's not really something I'm too concerned with, if I'm, if I'm being quite honest. You guys already highlighted the defense. I love it. Really love Tommy Eichenberg as well. I mean, that dude's a jack of all trades. I mean, this defense is absolutely stacked with an elite coordinator who should have won the Broyles Award in 21 instead of Gaddis. But um, I digress. Let me jump into schedule. So they basically start with three bye weeks and then they go at Notre Dame. Okay, so they're 3-0 and going to the Notre Dame game. The Notre Dame game could be a little bit tricky because it's at Notre Dame and Notre Dame has Sam Hartman. Let's not forget that. A very elite quarterback there. But Notre Dame has also lost some pieces as well. They lost one of their best wide receivers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I definitely lean to Ohio State, especially with Ohio State's defensive prowess. Then we go into a bye week to prepare for Maryland, a team who I'm a little higher on um, than Shub. But the bye week, I think, gives them plenty of time to prep for Maryland. Maryland is a win. They go at Purdue. A lot of uncertainty with Purdue, but from an absolute matchup standpoint, Purdue really shouldn't be in this game at all. But we'll see. Ryan Walters is a good coach. We'll see what they can do there. But I've got that chalked up as a win. They get Penn State at home, which could be tricky, but it is at home. I tend to lean towards a win for Ohio State there, but Penn State is not going to be a pushover this season. Then they go at Wisconsin, and I'm actually a little bit concerned for them for this at Wisconsin game. I actually, I'm pretty high on Wisconsin. I like Wisconsin to come out of their side of the division, but I think that game is a little tricky. Then they go at Rutgers. That's a win. Michigan State, win. Minnesota, they have them at home. I tend to lean towards a win. And at Michigan is definitely a probable. You've lost the last two against Michigan, and you're playing at Michigan. It's not easy. And you did highlight, I agree, Michigan has a ton of talent. This is going to come down to the X's and O's because both teams have the Jimmys and Joes. So this is just going to be who's the better coach in this game. So far, it hasn't been Ryan Day, but it's really hard to be a team like Ohio State three years in a row, despite how much of a quality team you are. I mean, you mentioned it, Shub. How many teams can actually compete with Georgia? Last year, if Georgia played Michigan, do you think it would have been a close game? I don't think so, especially given the TCU outcome. Ohio State is built to play teams like that. So it makes me favor Ohio State in this matchup, even though they'll be away. So where's that leave me, guys? I'm going to sit on the over with 11 wins, 11-1 Ohio State. I can definitely see them losing a game. It's going to be Penn State, Wisconsin, or Michigan. They're going to lose one of those games. I think they'll beat Notre Dame. Those are tricky, but I think they go three and one in their tricky games. Give me the over for the Bucks. All right, so we got two overs from Gonzo and Zan on Ohio State at 10.5. I am on the under. So far, I'm playing contrarian right here with uh, the big boys, Michigan and Ohio State, but would not be surprised if I'm wrong here. Let's, let's put it that way. I think the defense is going to carry the Ohio State this year. So I think that's going to be really fun to watch. Now it's time to move on to Penn State. Penn State's kind of like that wild card team in this division. They're the team that could really throw a wrench into what has been the MO here of Michigan or Ohio State winning this division for the last six or seven years or so. But Penn State's that dark horse team. They're getting the dark horse label just like Florida State is and teams like Washington and Oregon this year. Penn State's kind of in that tier. This is James Franklin's 10th season at Penn State. Can you guys believe that? He's been there for a decade now. Crazy. It's crazy. I remember when he was at Vanderbilt when I was coming out of high school. I mean, that's just crazy to think that was that long Dude, ago now. I, I saw him beat UF in the swamp. That That's how long ago we're talking here. We're getting old, boys. We're getting old. But anyways, Penn State comes in with a line of nine and a half wins. One game under Michigan, Ohio State, ten and a half. Drew Alar. He is the new starter this year. The former five-star prospect, he's getting a lot of hype. I think a lot of this this team's trajectory this year is based off of what we're going to see from Drew Alar. He only threw 60 passes last year with 125 passer rating, not the greatest. 
I think overall, when you look at Drew Lar, he may not pass as well as Sean Clifford was, but I think he's a better runner. And overall, this QB room is very young and inexperienced if you look at it holistically. So a minor red flag there, but I think the upside with Drew Alar is, of course, there. So we'll see what happens this year. The running back room, terrific combo with Nicholas Singleton and Catron Allen. Singleton averaged 6.8 yards per attempt last year. Elite numbers right there from him. The receiving core, they do lose their top three receiving leaders from last year, but I do like the guys that are projected to start this year even better. I actually think this receiving core could be better than it was last year. Big reason for that, portal addition, Dante Cephas from Kent State. Big addition there. I like him a lot. The offensive line, not the greatest last year. They were 60th overall in average line yards created, and they only returned 51% snap continuity from last year, which is one of the worst fit rates in all of Power 5. So offensive line is a little bit of a concern here. I actually think it could improve slightly, but offensive tackle depth is definitely a concern. I think if the offensive line deals with injuries, that is a very, very big red flag for Penn State this season the defense last year defense fourth overall in efficiency 14th in line yards 28th in sack rate defensive line very good i think it has a chance to improve last year with a lot of returning experience chop robinson the key cog there along the d line he was the best edge rusher in the big 10 last year by pff linebacker solid starters with abdul carter and curtis jacobs who killed me in my illinois dynasty and then the secondary secondary P potential to regress here because they lose Jair Brown and Joey Porter. Both those guys, they lost to the draft, but Kalen King, a returning piece that I really like, he was a number two corner in the big 10 last year. And I think all in all the safety, the secondary, I should say the secondary, I don't think the drop off is going to be that big. I actually lock, like a lot of the guys that they have returning. I, I don't think it'll drop off that much. If not, it could be just as good as it was last year. They have some talent there on the defense. So, now we look at the schedule here for Penn State. I like them to start pretty much 7-0 and going into that Ohio State game. I am worried slightly about that at Illinois and Iowa stretch right there, weeks three and four. There is a chance you could lose one of those games. I think it really depends on Drew Alar. We'll see how Alar does against both those teams because they have really good defenses, Illinois and Iowa do. So I think seeing how Alar performs against those defenses – will give you a good measuring stick of what to expect going into the final stretch of the season, which does get a little dicey. You got to go at Ohio state at Maryland, which is they're kind of like the middle tier team in this division. Then they got Michigan and then they end at Michigan state in Ford field. So all in all, you're sitting here with this line of nine and a half, man, this was really tough for me, guys. I took Penn state seven to one to win the big 10 when it first opened. I think, DraftKings or Caesars hung that one out there. And since it's closed to like only six to one or 500 to one. Oh, this was tough guys, but I'm going to go under. I'm sorry, Penn state fans. My numbers only have them projected for 8.9 wins, but I totally see the upside here. I just see the red flags, the red flags of Alar, not necessarily living up to his potential and then offensive line depth. Those are big concerns to me. I think the defense will be great, but if I was to bet on this team, I would take them to win the Big Ten, not this win total, because I think if you're going to play the upside, you might as well just take them to win the Big Ten, because if they can somehow win this division, they're going to win the conference. They're better than pretty much every team in the West. So that's my two cents. Three losses, I think, could be likely, but we'll see. I would like to be wrong about this, because I would like to see Penn State uh, take a stab at it and uh, see a little change of the guard here in this division. Yeah, I reiterate a lot of what you said, Shub. Um, one thing about Penn State, you know, I'm not really as high on James Franklin as a head coach, but I love their coordinators. Manny Diaz, you know, he was never meant to be a head coach. He is a great coordinator. I mean, the defense, fourth in defensive efficiency is just proof in the pudding. They have Mike Yersich, who's been proven at basically every stop he's ever had. They're 21st in offensive efficiency. And we mentioned that that could, I mean, they're improving, they're bringing back their running backs. They're bringing back a decent uh, group of wide receivers. I mean, that could definitely hold to what it was last year, maybe even slightly improve. I share the same concerns when it comes to the offensive line. They definitely lost some pieces there and they, you know, were 60th in line yards and 52nd in passing down sack rate. So there could be some regression there or at least the status quo 
which all in all, when you're trying to beat the big dogs like Ohio State and Michigan, who both have elite defensive lines, that is very, very tough. That can be a very hard situation. Now, let's jump into personnel. I mean, I've already kind of, we already kind of went through the offense and I agree with a lot of the points you made. I love their secondary guys. I know they lost some players to the NFL, but I think their secondary is going to be an outstanding unit. Uh, their safeties will have to definitely step up a little bit. Um, but overall, I think they're a very well coached group and they will produce this year. Love their linebackers. I think they're absolutely elite. I mean, Abdul Carter, as you mentioned, he's a true sophomore, guys. I mean, he's a, he's an absolute beast. That dude's made in the lab. And then they also brought in Alonzo Ford from Old Dominion um, on the defensive line to complement, you know, Chop, as you mentioned. And they have great depth at their pass rushers, uh, for their pass rushers. So I really like Penn State. Their defense is going to be the bell of the ball. I, I'm kind of with you, Shub. I think their floor and their ceiling is definitely determined by the play of Drew Alar. But I really like the potential of Drew Alar. Um, I really think he's going to be better than Clifford was as a uh, long-term starter. Drew Alar may have some early season struggles, but I think their defense is going to be very forgiving. And the fact that they have an elite running back in Nick Singleton, and they have good depth behind Nick Singleton as well, that bodes really well for some growing pains. You play West Virginia, you play Delaware. First two games, you should outmatch those teams. West Virginia is a power five opponent. Should be a pretty good practice run for Drew Lahr to get his feet um, get comfortable this year. Then they go at Illinois. I share the concerns. Illinois has got a really good defensive line. Their offensive line is kind of what's suspect to us. But ultimately, I think their defense is going to be what wins them that game against Illinois because I mean, Illinois is taking a little bit of a step back, in my opinion, on uh, offense this year. And I think Penn State's defense will give them the edge in that game. Iowa is definitely a probable, but they are at home. So I kind of lean towards a win there against Iowa. But that one is definitely a tricky one that could put the win total in jeopardy. At Northwestern is a bye week. Then they have a bye week. Then they have a bye week in UMass. So they get three bye weeks to prepare for Ohio State. So that's always a plus, but it's at Ohio State. We mentioned the Ohio State personnel. I I mean, I'm not going to say it's a complete loss for them. I think they have a chance in this game, but I'm chalking it as a loss for consideration of this total. Then they get Indiana by a week for a win. Then they go at Maryland, who they beat 30-0 to zero last year, by the way. And I think they actually just match up with Maryland really well. Maryland's strength is their passing attack. Penn State's strength is their defense and their secondary, really just their whole level of their defense. And Maryland actually has a weaker defensive line this year, and I think Nick Singleton's going to run all over them. I think they handled Maryland pretty uh, pretty handedly by a couple scores. Then they go off, play Michigan, lost 41-17 last year, but in Happy Valley the year before, they narrowly lost 21-17. to I think they can give the Michigan Wolverines a game, if not beat them. Late season, Happy Valley, this is going to be the conference. I mean, the conference is going to be on the line. They're going to be motivated. Assuming Penn State hasn't tripped up um, multiple times here and they only have a loss to Ohio State, maybe Iowa, they're still very much mathematically alive in this situation. So they will be playing Michigan hard. Rutgers is a win. Then they play at Michigan State. That should be a win. This game comes down to Ohio State, Michigan, and Iowa. And for me, I think you just go one and two. All you have to do is go one and two in those games. And that's 10 wins. I'm on the over, guys. 10 State was one of those teams that did not get too adversely affected by the coaching carousel. In fact, they may even have upgraded. They brought in Marcus Higgins from Virginia to coach the wideouts. And to my knowledge, Taylor Stubberfield was kind of one of those See you later. We're kind of happy you're gone situations. And then Dion Barnes, a grad assistant. I mean, they gave him a keys to a Porsche right there as the new D line coach. So even though he's inexperienced, having uh, absolute studs on the line will make his job a bit easier. As with every single win total we do, fellas, comes down to the schedule. And my three games of interest are the Ohio State, Maryland, Michigan. And the fact that the Big East is structured. The fact that the line is structured that Penn State could lose to both Ohio State and Michigan and still win double-digit games, that puts me on the over. 
And if they can at least beat one of those two, then this almost guarantees that over for me. Ten wins for the Nittany Lions. Good points, guys. Once again, complete contrarian. Complete am, contrarians today. I, I, know. I, I Do we have an I'm, alliance, Gonzo? Did we form an alliance so. behind behind uh, Shoes back here? Seems to be the way. No, but I, I, as I mentioned, I could totally see myself being wrong, especially about Ohio State and Penn State. But like I said, I'm Penn State fans. I'm not doubting you. I'm, I'm holding the seven to one ticket on Penn State, which I got great value on. You can't get that anymore. So I want to see them win the Big Ten because I, I, I get a little bit of cash in my pocket. But we shall see. It's time to move on to Maryland. Now we're we've gone through the three big dogs. A little bit of disagreement here between me and the other two. But let's move on to the Terps. The Terps are like right smack dab in that average category in this conference. Average in the Power Five. Maybe there's something we're missing with Maryland. Maybe maybe this is a team that can make some noise. Maybe pick off one of the big dogs at the top. Zan, lead us off on the Terps. I think Maryland is one of those teams that often gets slept on. Um, I mean, or at least for this year, I think a lot of t- people are sleeping on Maryland. Their plus 4.5 net tarp rating usually means a little bit of positive um, production, improvement from last year, 40th off- offensive efficiency last year, 35th in defensive efficiency, 41st in line yards. The sack, the passing down sack rate is what's concerning here, 126th. So they're not blocking for my man, uh, Mr. Tagovailoa there. But ultimately, he's still being quite productive despite having one of the worst pass blocking offensive lines in all of Power Five and all of college football, really. Um, and so I would say that just by how bad that offensive line was at pass blocking, they can only improve this year. How much? I don't know if it's going to be significant, but regardless, they have good um, they have good line yards and they have good defensive and offensive efficiency. I like that a lot. They have Josh Gaddis, who they brought in from Miami. That's a former Broyles Ward a winner. Take that as you will. He did, you know, get fired from Miami in one season. So there is a little bit of a toss up there. Brian Williams at D- uh, DC. And then this is Mike Loxley, um, who brings in actually, I think, a pretty good team this year. So I mentioned Talia Tagovailoa, hit 3,000 passing yards. 18 for eight, 18 touchdowns, eight picks. Considering that you're going two to one with ratios and you have terrible offensive line, I think that means you're a pretty solid quarterback. I really like that from Maryland. Um, they also have a pretty, they have pretty solid QB depth too. So Billy Edwards, I actually like him a lot. He played um, in his previous destination. He actually played pretty well in, against Michigan of all defenses in very limited snap work. He was like five of nine, like almost hundred yards in the tutty. Um, so he was pretty solid in limited work. They also returned Roman Hemby, who is basically a thousand yard rusher with 10 touchdowns, 5.3 yards per carry. Good running back. Really like what they have there. They lose Rakeem Jarrett, but they returned Sean Jones, who was about a 550 yard and four touchdown guy. And then they bring in two transfers I really like and Tyrese Chambers from FIU, another 500 yard guy. And then Caden Prather from West Virginia, who is another 500 yard guy. And, and Caden Prather, I think it's actually highly underrated. His stats don't really show how good he is because West Virginia was just terrible in offense last year and they couldn't get the ball to any of their wide receivers. So I think Caden Prather was actually the best receiver that the uh, Mountaineers had last year. And he is now a Terrapin. Now they did lose one of their best guards, Spencer Anderson. That definitely hurts, but hey, I love what they return and what they brought in. I think their offensive line is going to improve significantly this year. They returned their best tackle, Delmar Glaze, who was like the only guy there who was like worth a dang and pass blocking uh, last season. But then they also bring in Mike Purcell from Duke. We talked about how good their offensive line was last year. They bring in guard Corey Bullock from North Carolina Central. And then they bring in Gottlieb Ayadezi from Frostburg State. I'm not really sure what Frostburg State is, but he was a four-star transfer I feel like they're just making up colleges at this point. You know, I mean, sounds like a North Cole, North Pole college right there. Yeah. Yeah. Frostburg Frostburg State, State. George Fox. uh, How did Gundy uh, miss him? Yeah. George Fox, (laughs) you know, Virginia Mechanic Institution, uh, you know, all that. You know, I mean, they're just making up colleges at this point. But anyway, somebody, somebody slipped through the cracks for Mike Gundy, man. Somebody I'm telling you, cracks. I'm telling you. And there's even a team called Slippery Rock. Some people are just making stuff up, I feel like. But anyway, anyway, off to the defense, guys. Off to the defense. So if that doesn't tell you, I actually really love this offense this year. I, I, I mean, you protect you protect Talia a bit more, and I think they're definitely going to do so. There's going to be a very good chance this offense improves this year. I really like the portal additions. Safety, cornerback, 
here's where it gets a little dicey. They lost both of their starting cornerbacks, Jacorian Bennett and Deontay Burks, or Banks, sorry, to the NFL. That's a little bit of a concern, but they do bring in Jaquan Shepard, who's a four-star from Cincinnati, um, and they return both of their safeties, and they also bring in Avante, Avante Williams from Miami, who is a four-star transfer. I think they definitely supplement some pieces, but I do have some concern at the cornerback position specifically, considering that they lost both starters. That's a lot of snaps and experience to be losing in that spot. They do return some pretty solid linebackers and Jashawn Barham and uh, Finaji Gote who are both really good in pass coverage, actually. So I think that bodes well, and that can help with some of the inconsistencies from the um, from losing some corners. Ultimately, I think their pass coverage will be a little bit um, not as good as last year, but still pretty solid. Defensive line, guys. Defensive line is the biggest concern with this team. This is where it gets really dicey, and I think that they might struggle against teams with good running backs, um, like a Michigan or like a Penn State or an Ohio State. And in this particular situation, they lose two four-star transfers to the likes of Arkansas and Auburn from their defensive line. They bring in Jordan Phillips from Tennessee, who's basically a redshirt freshman. He's projected to start as a redshirt freshman. They bring in defensive end Donnell Brown from St. Francis, Pennsylvania, who grades pretty, he's, he has pretty elite grades per PFF, but keep in mind, this was, I believe that's a division two team. I, I don't even know where they're at. Um, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so my, my thing is there's a lot of youth on their defensive line. There's a lot of depth concerns as well, considering that they're playing a freshman or a freshman is projected to start. It tells me a little bit about their depth. Um, that's definitely the biggest concern I have for this team. But all in all, aside from those things, I think this team is very solid all around other than the defensive line. Um, line seven. They open against Towson. Should be an easy win. Charlotte. Charlotte's lost a ton to the portal. They got gutted, and they weren't that good to begin with. Should be an easy win. They're going to play Virginia. Should be an easy win. We talked about how horrendous Virginia is going to be this year, guys, in the ACC win totals. Uh, should be a win. They go at Michigan State to open up the uh, conference slate. Not very high in Michigan State this year, guys. I think they handle Michigan State. Then they get a bye week against Indiana. Should win that game. Then they go at Ohio State. Look, I think this is, a, I have it listed as a probable to a loss. I think it's more likely, uh, more than likely a loss. I'm definitely chalking it up as a loss on their win total. But I think it's a game that they could compete with Ohio State and maybe even give them a scare. They did play Ohio State pretty competitive um, in recent uh, memory. And then they play Illinois. I think they'll win that game. I like the matchup for that. Uh, Illinois lost Chase Brown, which... Now they cannot use that to play against Maryland's biggest weakness, which is their defensive line. And I think that's something that bodes well in that matchup, not to mention that game is at home. I think Maryland's got a good shot to win that game. Then they go on a bye week. Then they go at Northwestern off a bye week. Come on, man. That's a win. Then they play Penn State. I have a probable, but I lean loss for the same reasons. Penn State has elite running backs, um, and that's gonna that's not a good matchup for Maryland. Then they play at Nebraska. I have a as a probable because it's at Nebraska and Nebraska is well coached, but I still think Nebraska doesn't have as much roster talent as they need to be truly competitive this year. I lean towards a win there for Maryland. Michigan I have as a probable lean to a loss, but definitely trappy because Michigan could be on the look ahead to Ohio State. And then at Rutgers is a win, guys. So by my numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight maybe even nine wins in the cards i'm on the over guys over on maryland zan it's no doubt that maryland has really started building something to work with given this was an acc school you know about a decade ago loxley has appeared to be a very solid hire he also had the foresight to bring Kevin Sumlin in from the good old USFL. That'll be interesting as uh, Kevin will be a co-OC with Josh Gass and coaching tight ends. But that is still another veteran coach. I mean, he's coached in the SEC. He's coached in the Pac-12. A guy who's coached all over to come in and get a hand on a very good receiving core. In addition, even though the secondary will be a little bit hampered, Zach Spavadol is coming in from Texas State after the fallout with his brother getting fired. Good to see him get a landing spot, and I think he'll be able to coach these guys up. 
to help the secondary lock down some of these high flying offenses they might face this year. Looking at the schedule, I see actually six automatic wins. The non-con, Indiana, Northwest Rutgers. That, that is the benefit of being in the Big East. Michigan State, I have as a toss-up because you're going in the East Lansing, but the Terps probably win that. So, so boom, we're at seven now. If they pick off one of the big three, that's eight, or even simpler, just split between Illinois or Nebraska. So with the offensive power that remains, with a vet like Talia leading the quarterback room, with fantastic coaching hires from Loxley, from Loxley himself coming in to coach the quarterbacks, and the schedule favoring as it does, I think that it is going to be pushed over for Maryland. I see an eight and four Terrapin team more than a seven and five and nine and three playing in the big 10 East would just be fantastic, but I'm definitely high on the pins this year. I love your terminology, uh, big East. <laughs> Did I say big, oh, yeah, about the big 10. Yeah, you said the big East. I, I apologize. <laughs> you know, some of the, but some of the teams at the bottom got me thinking of the old big East. I, I know. That's that... why I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Rutgers fans listen to this like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. <laughs> the Spider-Man meme at <laughs> the mirror. <laughs> well, it appears Gonzo and Zan are in lockstep here. They are agreeing so far down the board here in the Big Ten East division so far. I've been contrarian. Am I going to be contrarian here for the fourth time in a row with Maryland? Nope. I'm over, boys. But I'm shocked. I'm... Like I said, I'm not as high on this team maybe as you guys are. I, I'm lean over here. I think seven wins is actually most likely for Maryland, but this team has some pieces. Don't get me wrong. Like They have some individual players that I really like, but there's some red flags here. The first one is the OCs. I think this is being overlooked big time here. You hire Josh Gaddis and Kevin Sumlin as your co-OCs. The, guys, the... Those are like two of the worst offensive coordinator candidates that I could possibly imagine you hiring. And plus, let's not let's when not the forget to award in twenty one. <laughs> oh, that was that was a load of BS. You guys know that. That was I know. Jen Null should have won it. Jen Null should have won it. Not well. I think I think Josh Gaddis got exposed big time with Miami, his Miami stint. Because if you talk to a lot of Michigan people, from what I've heard, is that Gaddis was really not responsible for how good the the offense was that year when he won it. That was a complete fraud award. Um, I'm sorry to trash the guy, but like, and then Kevin Sumlin, are you kidding me? Like even Mike Loxley said, Mike Loxley even said during the spring game that his, that watching the offense in the spring game was like watching paint dry. And I'm like, Dan Enos was a good OC guys. Like there's a reason why Arkansas and SEC team was poaching Dan Enos. He's a good offensive coordinator. That's a big loss. So I, I see the coordinators and play calling as a big red flag that could potentially hold this offense back from what his true potential should be. The defense last year was 35th overall in efficiency. I mean, Brian Williams has, did such a good job last year, and I call that. I was I had this over last year for Maryland as one of my best bets, primarily because I thought Brian Williams was going to really jump the defense, and he jumped it way more than I thought. But 35th seems like the ceiling for this defense. I think it's going to regress. And, yeah, my numbers actually have eight eight wins for Maryland, 8.0 on the dot. So my numbers actually say Maryland is a very strong over, but uh, I see some downside here. I see some downside with offensive play calling and, you know, all the other things that you guys said. So I think seven and five sounds about right, but let's be real here with this schedule. They're not going to only be six and six. Like the schedule is too easy. I mean, it's very likely they should start out five and oh with the beginning of that schedule. So I, I'd have to be a maniac. Even if I'm down on this team, I can't sit there and be like, yeah, they're only going to win six games. No, they're, they're going to get to seven just by virtue of the schedule. I know. Like, Shu, you mentioned they start 5-0 and oh, and then look ahead, man. They have Northwestern and Rutgers on the schedule. That's seven <laughs> right there. <laughs> right. Don't forget, Shu, Kevin Sumlin has a Heisman winner under his belt. I know Johnny Manziel was a freak, but it is a Heisman winner nonetheless. So I like the prospects <laughs> yeah i don't like to trash co coaches but i i'm not liking that those oh, hires no there. if you're gonna if you're gonna trash trash the coaches and the players absolutely that is fair 
All right. So we finally have a three-way agreement on a team. Maryland over seven wins. So we are higher on the Terps relative to the line that sportsbooks pegged. Now it's time to move on to Michigan State. And boy, I don't know if it's going to be uh, very favorable. Uh, I don't know if the outcomes for our win total projections are going to be very favorable for Michigan State. I have a little bit of a hunch. Just look at the line. The line does a lot of the talking. Gonzo, take us away on the Spartans with a win total of just four and a half wins. Not coming. The question is, where is he coming from and going to? Looking at the quarterback room for starters, Payne Thorne, that's a big loss to Auburn. If he was coming back, you know, this line maybe isn't even at the number that it's set at. Noah Kim, Kate and Hauser are the two guys fighting to be the starters. I have no intel on how the spring's going, but I do know that the, neither of them having significant in-game experience can and most likely will be problematic. So there's a question mark at quarterback with Thorne's absence, especially the fact that he left another to left to basically be in a QB battle at Auburn. At the running back position, Jalen Berger is a highlight. So I think the run game will be more, more often decent as it has been the last few years under talk. And he's got some decent depth behind him, both transfers. Wide receiver core, I'm really not high on. Uh, their number one guy is really going to be Trey Mosley, who just graded out average. And then there's really no other names outside of Antonio Gates' son. That's a nifty little tidbit if anybody wants to feel a little older um so besides trey mosley is a redshirt senior and antonio gates in a second year in college football ball i mean no name really jumps off the screen at me with this receiving core looking at the line i do like some of the options that they have more so in the interior a uh, jd duplain redshirt senior really good with pass and run block and then nick samick also a senior good at pass and run block but then after them, I just have questions really about the depth and, again, the playing time. But I don't think this is an absolutely horrendous offensive line. Going to the defense, shocker. A bunch of transfers on the D-line. Uh, Tonmis Adelay from Texas A&M, he's coming in at D-end. And DeAndre Butler from Liberty is coming in at D-tackle. And you got a couple other pieces behind them to compliment Avery Dunn, who, who was about average in pass rush at end last year. And a guy who I will like to watch on this line will be Jacoby Winman. He's a redshirt senior, and he graded out very well in PFF as a run stopper and a pass rusher and even somehow in coverage. So he'll probably be kind of the anchor of that D line, I would think, as one of the starters. In the linebacking position, you've got two solid names, and Aaron Gruel, who graded out well as a pass rusher, and Darius Snow, who runs stopping is kind of more of his game there in the middle. And then the secondary, this was an issue that's kind of plagued them under the Mel Tucker regime. They, There is a significant drop-off between the starters and the backups. And the starters, well, they lose two guys, Ron Williams the second, Amir Speed. And the other on the other side, Charles Brantley, he grew it out below average. So... Really, the only names I think that could maybe stand out is Terry Roberts coming in from from Iowa, and then Chester Kimbrell playing that that nickel position, as well as Dylan Tatum. So I'm really not too sold on this secondary as a whole. And now getting into the schedule with this interesting conglomeration that the Spartans have should beat Central Michigan to kick off Friday Night Lights. Should beat Richmond, Washington. I, no, 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 no. I do not think they are going to beat Washington. I think that Penix, in a return to bit in um a return to Big Ten land, is going to have a field day, and the Huskies win that game. I think Maryland is a loss. I think Talia is going to carve up that secondary. Conversely, I think Maryland's defense is going to lock down up Michigan State at Iowa. I think it's a loss because Iowa just has the juice and knows how to use their defense to win these games. So now we're looking at two and three going into the bye week. Rutgers, that's a win. 
even though I am higher on Rutgers this year, I think they beat Rutgers. So now we're looking at three and three Michigan. This is not the old, you know, mid 2010s. That is going to be a loss at Minnesota. I got as a toss up, you know, same with Nebraska. Those are kind of two toss ups that depending on what day you get those teams. I mean, let's see where Nebraska even is at this point in the season. You know, those can maybe be ones that the Spartans sneak out, which would be crucial because that, that is going to be the determining line potentially. Then at Ohio State, I have as a loss. At Indiana is a win. And Penn State is a loss. So really, this is going to come down is can you be either Minnesota or Nebraska? And my verdict is I do not think so. I think under is the result from the Spartans this year. I just think four and eight is very possible with the questions at quarterback and with a secondary that I really, of all the transfers that Mel takes, I really don't think he did much to booster this unit outside of bringing in Terry Roberts. So under on the Spartans this year. Yeah, you can see this line opening at four and a half. If you're Mel Tucker, you're now you're going into your fourth season at Michigan State. You get that huge contract after year one. And your win total sitting at four and a half, not not a good look at all. Of course, the portal losses were huge, but guys, four and a half, that's a little that's a little rough. It's a little rough line there. Most sports books actually had Michigan State at five and a half. I think they dropped down to five. Most books are at five. I think Caesars is the lowest one at four and a half. And for reasons of just playing the numbers here, Caesars is the low man on Michigan State at four and a half. I think Tuck's coming for five wins, boys. Tuck's coming for five wins. Give give me an over here. It's a lean over. My numbers have 4.8. I'm I'm not high on this team. I don't have many good things to say about this team. But again, we're doing this in relation to what the lines are. So like if they had this line at five or five and a half, I'd be talking about how terrible Michigan State is and say under. It's still a terrible team, but I say over because the line's at four and a half. I think they can get five wins. I mean, you got Central Michigan, Richmond, potentially Maryland at home. I mean, let's not forget, guys, Maryland and Michigan State are both two teams that play up and down to their opponents. Michigan State last year, I mean, hell, they they lost to Indiana last year, and then they only beat Rutgers by six at home. Yet they also beat some of the be- they almost beat some of the better teams in their conference last year. They played up to their competition. So Let's not leave that out of the realm of possibility. I will say the scheduling dynamics are brutal because you play down to your opponents. You got to play Rutgers away. You play Indiana away. You got Minnesota away. I think their West draw was not not favorable at all. They got to go at Minnesota, at Iowa. They're a notch below both those teams, and those are away. So, yeah, I I totally understand why this line's at four and a half. I, I think most likely it's either four or five wins. I don't see a bowl game, but... I'm willing to give Noah Kim, the quarterback, I'm willing to give him a chance. I I don't think that he'll necessarily be terrible. In fact, I think there's a chance he could be not much of a drop-off behind Peyton Thorne. I'm I'm going to say Tuck's coming for five wins, boys. Tuck's coming for a minor over here at four and a half. Minor over. I love that. <laughs> so, Gonzo, I want to go back to what you said. Because <laughs> I literally have in my notes right here. Game versus Nebraska decides this win total legitimately Agreed. go through the schedule man central michigan i have a probable to a lean win because i think central michigan's not going to be that good um they should beat central michigan should beat richmond washington maryland l's iowa at iowa l by week at Rutgers. i don't have that as a win i have that as a probable as Shu mentioned they only won by six and Rutgers actually has one of the better defensive lines in college football, which people don't really give them credit for. I think that bodes really poorly for an inexperienced QB. And I also expect some regression from this offensive line, considering they lost their best tackle, who was also graded out as their best overall lineman. So I'm expecting a little bit of a drawback there. And they don't really have... Now, I know you mentioned Jalen Berger. I'm actually not very high on Jalen Berger. He didn't have very good splits per yards per carry. Uh, he wasn't very efficient. I do like their transfer, Nathan Carter from UConn, actually more than him. He's like a 6.2 yards per carry kind of guy, and he could take that position over from Jalen Berger. I mean, this team, man, like, how do you lose Jaden Reed and Keon Coleman and a bunch of other depth pieces and not supplement it in the portal? How do you not go after anyone? Like, how do you how do you not bring in at least one serviceable guy? I mean, if you're if you're Mel Tucker 
and you're getting paid this boatload of cash every single year, how are you not trying to replace these pieces in the portal? It's kind of inexcusable because now you have a very inexperienced QB. And then, I mean, you have Sam Levitt, who's a four-star freshman waiting in the mix. Maybe we see him if, if it really hits the fan. But my God, guys, like you're not, you have, you have a very unproven, probably not a sub average QB. And then you have a sub average wide receiver room regression O line. My God, guys, this is uh it's going to be ugly. The defensive line is going to be the strength of this team. It's probably the only unit that's going to be somewhat serviceable, but I mean, look guys, I, I lean under, I'm just going to get that. I'm just going to, I'm just going to cut to it. Central Michigan, Richmond wins. Rutgers probable, Nebraska probable, Indiana probable of the probables. They need three to go over. I don't think that's going to happen. I lean under for Michigan State. All right, we are back to contrarian mode here for me, Shub versus Gonzo and Zan. You guys have yet to disagree so far. <laughs> you know, five it's not confident. Easy. I can definitely see. I think Michigan State is a four to five win team, hundred percent. Yeah. Anything higher than that? Hell no. No way. Whether you're over or under on this line, it's just the fact that we're talking about Michigan State with a line of just four and a half wins is is a big problem. Very big Dude, problem if, for Michigan if State. If I'm the AD for Michigan State, I'm looking at Tucker and I'm saying, I'm looking at Mel Tucker and I'm saying, bro, how do you lose all this wide receiver production, not bring anyone in? How are you going to have like the lead singer of BTS as your starting quarterback this year? <laughs> you know, like you're, how, how come we don't have – I mean, like, their safeties are weak. I mean, like, I don't know, man. I'm just looking at – you just look at the schedule. We're talking about potential of Tuck getting fired midseason here. This is a worst-case scenario. Whoa, okay. Bold take. I like it. It, it is a bold well, take. Look, look at the schedule, guys. Okay, let's say they beat Central Michigan, Richmond, 2-0. and Worst-case scenario here, they lose to Washington. They lose to Maryland. They lose to Iowa. They could lose to Rutgers. So we're looking at a team that's 2-4. and four. Then you got Michigan at Minnesota. Worst case scenario, this team is two and six going into the Nebraska game. If Michigan State's two and six going that late into the season, you can't tell me they're not thinking about firing him. Shoot, does that make you a little uh, more nervous for the over then if that happens? I mean, I don't think that'll necessarily happen. I, I think this team just a little bit better than we're giving them credit for. But yeah, I, I don't think mm -hmm. it's out of the realm of possibility. I mean, I'm I think Tucker is going to enter next season on the hot seat for sure. Yeah, I'm just saying it, it might. That process might be expedited here. The schedule, the scheduling dynamics are not looking good for Michigan State this year. They they did not get a good scheduling draw. I will say, Shub. So I just looked at Mel Tucker's buyout, and I mean, it would only be two million dollars. So that's it. Realm, really? Yeah, for how fat his contract is. From the sources I'm looking at, no new buyout terms were in that extension. It's two point five million before January fifteenth of last year. Two million in twenty twenty three. One and a half million in twenty twenty four. Wow. Yeah, somebody, somebody, uh, snuck might in get, a shoe. Somebody snuck he, in a safety valve on that contract. I know, shoe. He may very well get fired this year, man. That that actually, that actually adds to the um to the possibility. Yeah. Hey, I like I said, if if I I would not be surprised if this is a four win team. Let's just put it that way. But either way, I think none of us none of us believe Tuck's coming for a bowl game. Tuck might be coming for oh, unemployment by the sure. end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it is time to move on to Rutgers, a team that, you know, sits at the bottom of this division. But, hey, you know, this is a team with Greg Schiano that maybe they can get to a bowl game. There's a little bit of buzz around this team. Maybe this is a year where Schiano can take them back to a bowl game where he thinks they should rightfully belong. And I, I might not disagree with him here. Rutgers last year, they were 4-8. and eight. This is Schiano's fourth season at Rutgers in his second stint. It's his 15th season overall at Rutgers. The man just loves him some Rutgers. He's the man for the job here. Let's start off with the offense. Let's address the elephant in the room here. The, the offense was terrible last year, 122nd in FBS and offensive efficiency. I mean, I know in counting stats they were better than Iowa, but in terms of efficiency, at least Iowa was able to run clock and be on the field longer. So their efficiency numbers looked better than Rutgers but I mean that's just embarrassing if you're in Iowa's ballpark here for offense however there is some hope on the horizon new offensive coordinator Kirk Soraka comes over from Minnesota he replaces Sean Gleason who was fired Sean Gleason man he that boy that guy those experiments did not work out 
at Oklahoma State or Rutgers, unfortunately. Maybe he'll go back to Princeton or wherever he, wherever he came from. But I do like the OC hire with Soraka. Quarterback, last year, they split snaps between Gavin Wimsat and Evan Seinman. And both those guys split snaps. Both those guys were equally terrible last year. <laughs> Wimsat, as of right now, is projected to be the starter. And I think he has more upside. Of course, he was a former four-star recruit. They lose two of their top three receivers from last year. There's really not a whole lot to work with with skill positions here on this team. And then the offensive line, barely inside the top 100 in almost every single line metric last year. However, they do have a lot of experience coming back on the interior. But again, it was very poor performance last year. So maybe there's a chance the offensive line can get better just with sheer experience returning. And then the defense. Defense actually was respectable, 50th overall. They do return seven starters, and they return 72% of their production from last year on the defensive side of the ball, which is where I really see the room for hope for this team for getting to a bowl game potentially, as I think the defense has a chance to be pretty decent. The defensive line was quietly pretty solid. I remember the year before it was very solid too. They, they got decent defensive line production out there in Rutgers. I like their edge guys a little bit better than their interior. Aaron Lewis was graded as a top five edge rusher in the Big Ten last year. As far as a linebacker room, Deion Jennings, I like him as a solid player. Rest of the room, not so great. And then the secondary average to pour across the across the room last year in terms of PFF grades, but a lot of experience returning, which I think is the big point. I think this defense has a chance to get better just because they have 72% of their production returning. And then when we're looking at the schedule here, I I think there's a chance here that Rutgers best case scenario. I think they can start out 3-0. and Northwestern, they have them at home, which is nice. Northwestern, we'll get into them in the next podcast when we cover the West. Northwestern's looking like a mess right now. I like Rutgers in that game. Temple at home. Could be a loss, but I think it's more likely a win. Virginia Tech at home. I know, Zan, you're more highly on Virginia Tech than me. I, I think Rutgers has a chance to beat Virginia Tech. I think they beat Virginia Tech last year, if I'm not mistaken, and they, this year they have the Hokies at home. Probably they start out 2-1 and one more likely, but I think there's a chance they can start out 3-0, and oh, especially if Wimsat takes a step forward. And then you look at uh, Wagner there in Week 5. Again, best-case scenario, Rutgers starting out the year 4-1. and one. We already are at a push. And then just give me, maybe you pick off Michigan State at home. Maybe you can beat Indiana. After that, I don't see any potential wins, but if Rutgers is going to do it, it's going to be with the first eight games in the schedule. I think there's a chance here with the new OC, the new scheme. I think Wimsat has the potential to take a step forward with his development because he was a four-star recruit. I think that upside is there. I actually kind of like the defense a little bit. I like that they have a lot of these toss-up games against lower competition at home. Give me the over, boys. Give me the over. I like Greg Schiano just as a coach. I, I think this is the year that Schiano can get Rutgers potentially to a bowl game. If not, I kind of like them for five wins. I think four wins is is a floor. Really good point, Shub. Um, I share I share concerns with the QB room. I don't know if I'm as high on the QB situation, but although a new OC could definitely change that, definitely something to be considerate of there. Don't like their running backs. Uh, Kyle Monagai returns. He was the lead rusher last year. They also have Samuel Brown, who got some carries, but neither one of them had good yard per carry splits. They brought in Nassim Brantley from Western Illinois. It's 900 yards and nine touchdowns of production to come in at wide receiver. So it's at least some production that they can add to that. With you on the offensive line, the secondary is a big concern for me. I know you mentioned that like, they have a lot of returning production on um, defense. One thing about pr like production, your corners, your secondary pieces don't make as many tackles some safeties but corners and stuff not so much they don't they're not as replicated in the statistics they lost an elite corner in christian braswell to the nfl they lost two really good safeties in every young and christian isian also they got gutted in their secondary the only returners they have are not very graded are not well graded by pff and they did bring eric rogers from northern illinois but he's more of a run stopper and that's also playing at a lower level of of competition as well. So I have huge concerns with the secondary of this team. I do like their one linebacker, Deion Jennings, as you mentioned, he's a very good all around player, but again, the rest of that group is very suspect. 
Their interior offensive line, I'm not very impressed by, but they do have some great edge rushers um, that I really, really like, as you mentioned. And so they're definitely the strength of this team is definitely in their pass rush. But man, secondary concerns me. QB play concerns me. The, the poor running back rooms concerns me. The poor offensive line concerns me. I mean, even with a new coordinator, it's really hard to get around some of those some of those issues, especially when you play other teams um, who have uh, better situations and match up well against you. When I look at the schedule, Shub, I see six winnable games on their schedule. It's kind of what you alluded to. I see six winnable games. And I'm with you, Northwestern, Temple, Virginia Tech, they could very well start 3-0. and But Temple, they beat 16-14 to last year, very narrowly. And Temple actually has a pretty decent quarterback named EJ Warner, who has shown flashes of being pretty dang good. Um, he's had like 300, 400 yard games, three, four tutties. I think he had a five tutty game with like 300 yards too. I mean, he's actually a pretty solid player. I think that spells, that could potentially spell disaster for Rutgers, given that their offense is kind of stagnant. They're definitely going to have to take a step up to not lose to Temple. Northwestern, despite losing everyone, they're not just going to go into full quit mode on the opening day. Um, that is a probable. I know they're at home, but that is still one that Northwestern could potentially take from them as well. And then Northwestern also improved in the QB room. So, I mean, definitely something that could give Northwestern an edge there. Virginia Tech, man, I do think they actually do have a decent chance to beat Virginia Tech. I know I'm higher on Virginia Tech, but it's a matchup thing for me. Virginia Tech has a terrible offensive line. What's the strength of Rutgers? Their defensive line. That could spell disaster for Virginia Tech. But at the same time, if Rutgers can't score the dang ball, it's not going to matter, you know. Uh, so ultimately, it's going to be whoever um, whoever produces the most on offense. And that's really my biggest concern with Rutgers, guys. And then they also lost a bunch of secondary pieces, which even though they have a great D-line man, Virginia Tech added a lot of pieces on their offense I like that, that could expose them in the secondary. Uh, that That's dicey, man. I mean, you know what's crazy? They could go 3-0 and in the non-con. They could go 0-3 in their non-con. Um, very, very, like, wide range here. Uh, at Michigan is a loss. Wagner is a win, guys. I mean, you you pay Wagner to come in and give you a free dub. Um, if they lose that, then all hope is lost. Uh, burn the program down. And then at Wisconsin, loss. Michigan State, I have as a probable, uh, because Michigan State, uh, man, I, I just don't know. I think they match up well against Michigan State, guys, um, from a personnel standpoint. But I think Michigan State gets them, and it's a loss because Michigan State's also coming off a bye to play Rutgers. So that's an advantage for Michigan State. They go at Indiana, which they won 24 to 17 last year in a little bit of a struggle. Indiana has lost a lot of production this year, guys. I think that's definitely a winnable game for them. And then bye week, Ohio State, it's, it doesn't matter that you get your bye week for Ohio State. You might as, I mean, it's it's an L. Then you go at Iowa, that's an L. You go at Penn State, that's an L. I mean, it's it's a gauntlet. Their last four games is a pure gauntlet. And then they go with Maryland, that's an L. They're going to finish 0-4 for the season. For me, guys, Wagner, probably Indiana, I can give them that. And then basically in their non- in their non-con, they've got to go 3-0 and to get the over here. And I cite offense, offense concerns and secondary concerns for the reason I can't do it. Shub, when I was doing this, I texted you. Holy crap, man. I might go over on Rutgers. I can't do it, man. I think four wins is perfect. I think Rutgers will finish with four wins. If they finish with five wins, fantastic. That's awesome. Good for you, Rutgers. It's nice to not be the doormat for once. So I'll tell you what, man. I'm on the under, but I definitely see the potential for an over for Rutgers. Let's go Scarlet Knights. I just want to correct myself. They didn't beat Virginia Tech last year. They beat Boston College. That's what I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. So, but either way, I mean, pretty similar teams right there. So point still stands. So on Rutgers schedule after Indiana is Halloween. And I can imagine that uh, Greg Schiano, when he goes to a Halloween party that weekend, he's just going to have a piece of paper taped to him with the last four teams of the schedule, because that is horrifying. If you are a Rutgers fan. I think that Rutgers, even though it has traditionally been one of the lower teams in the Big Ten East, I think, again, schedule dynamics help them. 
the fact that Rutgers draws what might be the lowest team in the Big Ten West and potentially all of college football, though Stanford will, of course, have something to say about that, bodes well. So I think Northwestern is most likely going to be a win at home on an NFL type Sunday because you gotta love a Labor Day weekend college football opening, which which I do. I think it's awesome. And then even with uh Kurt Warner's son taking the reins at Temple, I still have faith in a defensive quote unquote mastermind that is Shiano. I mean, all kidding aside, he is a great defensive coach. I do have faith in his defense to sign me him and get that early win against Temple and beat Virginia Tech. So I see a 3-0 start. You got Wagner sandwiched in between Michigan and Wisconsin, which is a nice reprieve. You're at four right there. And then it's just get one between Michigan State and Indiana. And I think it's more likely than not that Rutgers will do that. I am on the over for the Scarlet Knights. I think this would be a lot dicier if the books hung a five out there. But I really like this number. I really like Rutgers to surpass this and i have faith in greg shiano so maybe not let's a bowl go. game over four wins so let's go. Go. finally yeah. somebody's on my side <laughs> finally i'm the out man but no i can see it happening guys but my biggest concern as i mentioned from the personnel standpoint but like i mentioned with the schedule i see six winnables and to go over they got they got to win five of the six winnables and i just not with the roster they have i just don't see it hey last year okay. was uh for vandy what was it over by october we got to come right. up with yeah. a, I, I got to come up with a Rutgers uh, over by Halloween hashtag here. <laughs> yeah, the season's I, over by Halloween. Yeah. Oh, it will <laughs> because be. they look oh, at the yeah. next four. <laughs> yeah, ha- Halloween. Yeah, get get me those five wins in the bank by Halloween, and then I don't care what happens the rest of the year. I don't, I don't care how mm-hmm. those how bloody those last four games are. But let's see if the Ohio State out of playoff. <laughs> hey, they got a bye week to prepare for Ohio State, guys. I don't know. No, I'm kidding. No shot. All right, moving on here to the final team in the Big Ten East, the Indiana Hoosiers sitting with a win total of four wins even, like their counterparts over in Piscataway. Zan, take us away on the Hoosiers. Guys, the Hoosiers were not very good last year. And one thing I really have to point out with, with, with them is they have a negative 12 net tarp rating. That's like Stanford level bad. That's one of the worst in all of FBS. That, that, and that Yikes. doesn't bode well for a team that was already terrible last year. They were 127th in line yards, 110th in sack rate, 88th in offensive efficiency, 53rd in defensive efficiency, surprisingly. But other than that, man, ugh. I don't know how, like, Tom Allen still has a job there. It's very interesting to me. But, you know, they brought in Walt Bell in 2022, and even that hire is very questionable. That dude was a, a two as a head coach from UMass was two and 23 as a head coach. I think I don't think the AD at Indiana cares about winning football games. Just just clearly like by nature of not like letting Tom Allen have this really ridiculously long leash and have, making really bad coordinator hires. But I digress. Let's look at the quarterback situation. Projected starter right now is a four star transfer from Tennessee, Taven Jackson. Okay, maybe there's some upside there. Uh, you know, Connor Bays lacks out and all their other situationships are, are, are done with. And who knows? Maybe there's something to be said about this. They have Josh Henderson and Jalen Lucas in tandem. Jalen Lucas at least had good yard per carry splits and very limited work, 5.5 yard per carries. Out of the wide receiver room, A.J. Barner, who they lose to Michigan, a really good tight end. And then they also lose Emory Simmons to Utah. They do return cam camper who is about 600 yards of production and then they bring in dequeese carter from fordham who had about 1200 yards of production and 13 touchdowns last year so there is something to be said about that there is some potential in their wide receiver room i think it actually improves a little bit this year and we'll see the quarterback is definitely a huge question mark but if he plays well we could definitely see improvement in the passing game for sure i still don't think it'll be elite given the nature of how bad their offensive line is, I think that is a huge limiting factor for them, especially when there are so many um, solid defensive lines in the Big Ten. That is definitely something that is going to bode poorly for Indiana, but at least there is some upside for the offense. They lose their starting tackles. They lose their starting tackles, guys. They return their best guard, but the online was already bad, and you're losing your starting outside presence. I mean... regression 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 guys i mean that's the name of this 
progression is all over Indiana. The red in their in their colors, man, it's progression. Over the defense, safety, cornerback. They lose their best corner in Taiwan Mullen. He's out in the NFL, believe it or not. They bring in a slew of transfers by way of Texas, Stanford, Texas Tech, all projected to be either starters or play significantly. But none of them are really graded poor. Are they're all graded poorly by PFF, or they just don't have any real experience to even merit a grade. So there is a huge question mark with their safety group, especially losing their one really really competent dude in that room. They're gonna take a step back in the secondary. Too many young guys, too many inexperienced dudes. I know guys like Nicholas Tumor from Stanford are a little bit older, but not not someone who really grades out well per PFF. Linebackers. They lost a lot, man. They lost Asan McCulloch to Oklahoma. They lost Cam Jones, who was elite versus the run. He had an, like an 89 PFF grade, which is like absolutely elite, guys, versus the run. They do bring in Joshua Rudolph from Austin P, who's pretty dang good in all phases. But keep in mind, he was playing at a lower level of competition. So we'll see how well that, that tracks. They bring in Jacob Mangum Farrar from Stanford, and then they return their best linebacker. And this is big for them. Aaron Casey, who is definitely the gem of this whole defense. He's the best player they have. And the linebacker room, I think, is actually still a pretty solid unit. It might be the strength of this defense. They also bring in Andre Carter at defensive end from Western Michigan, who graded out as a 93 transfer, a 93 grade four star transfer. Um, so that is definitely something that provides some potential there. They also bring Marcus Burris, a four star D line transfer from Texas A&M. So, and they also brought in a lot of other transfer pieces to add some depth. So there could be some improvement on the defensive line. There could be some improvement. We could see improvement with the linebacker group. Secondary is a huge question mark, but ultimately they may still have a pretty um, decent uh, defense. Given that they were 53rd in defensive efficiency last year, if they fall back, I think it will still stay within the top 70, which is still kind of bad, but 53 is much better than I, I tracked them for last year. But overall, guys, I just I don't think this is a good team. I don't think this is a well-coached team by any stretch of the imagination. Let's look at the schedule. Their line is sitting there at four wins. Ohio State, that's a loss. Indiana State, they should win that. Louisville's a loss. Akron, they should win that. At Maryland, probably a loss. Bye week at Michigan. You, that sucks for you that you had your bye week before Michigan. You should use that bye week to prepare for Rutgers because you play Rutgers after that. That's a winnable game. Um, but I lean towards a loss versus Rutgers, even though they are at home. I think the matchup favors Rutgers from a personnel standpoint, especially with how bad Indiana's offensive line is and how good Rutgers defensive line is. Uh, at Penn State is an L. Wisconsin is an L. At Illinois, I have as an L. Michigan State, I have as a probable. Purdue has a probable lean to an L because Purdue was at home. Guys, I'm on the under. Great analysis, Zan. So Tom Allen has been at Indiana since 2017, and his best year was that 2020 COVID season. And Indiana fans have just got to be just kicking themselves seeing how well Michael Penix has been doing over at Washington. Like that was that was their guy, and now he is off to much greener pastures on the West Coast. This offense, I share the same concerns with the offensive line, and that's where a lot of things start. If you can't pass block and can't run block, you're not going to move the ball. I mean, that's football 101. Having a good linebacking core is is a nice bright spot, but if they're really your only anchored down decent unit with a couple spread out good guys on the D front and in the secondary, that's just not enough to – put a good product out there that is going to competently stop any offense in any power five conference. Heck that might even be a problem against a couple American opponents. So there's two things Indiana could probably count on for the 2023 season. One is Tom Allen is not going anywhere. That buyout is $20 million. There is no shot. That man is getting fired for a lackluster season. Well, I didn't know that piece of information. That's uh, that's he has that's, he has no incentive something. to win. He's like, please fire me. I'll take the twenty million. <laughs> wow. So, even with that in mind, I still am on the under for Indiana. I see really three wins, if possible, and it's and Zan covered it. 
Indiana State, Akron, maybe Rutgers. And if I'm doing a ZKS pick on that, I'm probably picking Rutgers in real time. So I think it's going to be a rough year for Indiana, but it's okay because Tom Allen will come back. He'll reload, and hopefully this number can be higher than four in future seasons. But I really think it's going to be a tough time in Bloomington this year. It could be four and a half next season. <laughs> I, mean, I, would, I mean, that yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, speaking of that, I think one thing that is nice is that, you know, Indiana is in the Big Ten Conference. Therefore, by virtue of having that logo on their chest, they have a lot of big TV checks coming in. And so uh, maybe, you know, $20 million doesn't seem as big of a number as it did maybe, you know, a few years ago. But that being said, I did not know that. But that is pretty important, though, I will say, because a lot of my verdict here on this win total, which I have under, by the way, in case you were guessing, surprise. I think quit alert's a big factor here for Indiana, like I was saying. I mean, Tom Allen kind of is on the hot seat. It has not turned out well there. I mean, this is his seventh season at Indiana. It's 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 not really going in the right direction and the defense five projected transfer starters not look not a great look the qb room they completely flushed that out how many career passes do Taven jackson and, and brendan soresby have neither of them have more than seven career passes under their belt like quarterback room is is a huge unknown because there's lack of data to suggest if one of these guys is even good i mean i only see three to four wins um i already talked about how much i like rutgers I see Indiana State, thankfully for the Hoosiers, it's not baseball. And then Akron. <laughs> Akron was one of the worst teams in, in all of FBS last year, but they will be improved. But I think those are the only two guaranteed wins. And then after that, I mean, you get Rutgers at home, you get Michigan State at home, which is actually nice. They do have both those at home, but I don't think they win both those. I think at best they only win one of those. I see, I see four wins as a ceiling. I go under here. I think three to four is most likely. You want a bold take that Michigan State game? Both teams will be coached by interim head coaches. <laughs> that's that's a bold take. I like that. That's very bold. That, that's going to be a lot of buyout money coming in and out. It's a lot of cash flows coming in and out of the bottom of this for, this division this year. <laughs> All right. Well, with that being said, we had a good a bit of disagreement here for this division, the the Big Ten East. I, I liked it. Uh, well, I'm interested to see how this plays out this year. I think it's pretty easy to tier these teams in this conference, unlike in the Big 12. So it did make it a little bit easier, I would say, but also it is nice to group these teams up and it's a lot easier to kind of do these win totals, in my opinion. So that being said, thank you guys for watching. If you're on YouTube, thank you for listening. If you're on podcasts, leave a review. And of course, if you're on YouTube, leave us a like and leave us a comment. We want to hear your opinions. Tell us how, how stupid you think we are. Tell us what you think. If you agree with us, if you disagree with us, we like to hear it. Hey, we can take it. So with that being said, thank you guys for watching. This is you, Gonzo and Zan, signing out. The Saturday Scholars, we will see you for the Big Ten West. Let's go. Have a great day. <laughs>